Since its founding in 1998, Rotten Tomatoes has become the go-to site for getting a quick idea of what film critics think of a movie. Your individual tastes might vary, and we all love to watch some trashy cinema every now and then, but you can generally count on a film with a high score to bring some quality to the table. If you really want the cream of the crop, though, you can look for the films that racked up a unanimous critical endorsement and scored the coveted 100%. But there's a catch. The scores and the professional reviews that generated them stay up on Rotten Tomatoes forever, and almost all of them were written when the films were first released. While many great movies can stand the test of time, the years that pass can eventually reveal some flaws. Here are a few movies that haven't aged well, despite their 100% scores from critics. The Interview If you're surprised that The Interview got a 100% score, you're probably thinking of the 2014 movie about James Franco and Seth Rogen being sent to assassinate the leader of North Korea. Take him out. You want us to kill the leader of North Korea? Yes. What? That movie has also aged badly, but it wasn't exactly beloved to begin with. This interview is a 1998 Australian crime drama starring Hugo Weaving that made a big splash in indie film circles when it was released in the United States in 2000. The question is, why? The film consists almost entirely of an interrogation of Weaving's character at the hands of a police detective. It's like an Australian usual suspect, but with worse writing and no budget for flashbacks. Whether he's guilty or simply being railroaded is kept from the audience to a degree that makes it hard to find any truth in the story to latch onto. If you want proof that Hugo Weaving is a very good actor, the interview will accomplish that. But you can find that same proof in a much more entertaining form elsewhere. Roger and Me in 1989, Roger and Me seemed charming. The work of a then-unknown documentary filmmaker named Michael Moore, it featured the story of his troubled hometown of Flint, Michigan, and Moore's quest to confront General Motors CEO Roger B. Smith. The film goes into detail about the harm the company did to Flint by laying off huge numbers of workers in favor of cheaper labor in other countries. And Moore's dogged pursuit is engaging, even though he never manages to meet with the subject. When it was released, this movie was nothing like the impersonal documentaries that audiences were used to. Three decades later, though, it's a lot harder to enjoy. Flint never recovered and is still a city in crisis today. Michael Moore, meanwhile, is still doing his best to present the same dogged everyman persona that won over audiences in this film, but it feels far less sincere coming from an industry veteran than it did from an unknown in his 30s. In 1989, Michael Moore became a liberal hero, but these days, audiences think he's overstayed his welcome, regardless of their politics, if box office receipts are any indication. In that sense, you could say that Moore's own success has ruined his best film. Longtime Companion Longtime Companion was a movie that needed to be made. Its 1990 release was groundbreaking, presenting audiences with the first widely distributed motion picture dealing with the AIDS crisis that had been decimating the gay community for a decade. Unfortunately for modern viewers, the sadness of its story is far from the only thing that makes it hard to watch. Craig Lucas and Norman René, the writer and director of the movie, were both gay men who lived in the world they were depicting, but some LGBTQ activists felt like they were playing it safe in their depiction of the gay community. These critics called out the movie for being afraid to depict gay men as anything other than affluent and white, and to depict their relationships as truly romantic and sexual. It's clear that a major goal of the film was to tell a story that needed to be told to the people who hadn't heard or lived it. In that sense, Longtime Companion was a huge success in its time, but nobody watches it anymore, and there's a reason for that. The Terminator Oh, Terminator. You're one of our favorite movies ever, but that doesn't mean you've properly stood the test of time. Despite how cool your special effects were for 1984, we're only a decade away from Kyle Reese's cyborg-filled future, and we still have very little of the technology that we saw. Unfortunately, all the hairspray, neon-colored clothes, and Sarah Connor's roommate's music throughout Terminator often leaves us cringing as to what things were like in the 80s. The Terminator is justifiably looked back on as a sci-fi action classic, but from a modern perspective, it has a few big things working against it. For starters, it's a victim of its own success. It's so influential on everything that came after that we've seen the innovations and ideas that it brought to the screen refined dozens of times over the years. Even Arnold Schwarzenegger's iconic, emotionless, unstoppable killing machine, which blew audiences away in 1984 and made Arnold a household name, seems a little less special after 30 years, a handful of sequels, and a couple hundred imitators. I'll be back. Ha! You didn't know I'm gonna say that, did you? That's what you always say. I do? 
In that respect, it's a lot like watching the fight scenes in The Matrix and trying to remember how innovative they were before that style was in literally every action movie. Secondly, there's Sarah Connor, the target that the Terminator is sent back in time to execute. By Terminator 2 Judgment Day, we've seen Linda Hamilton evolve into a muscular, battle-ready action hero in her own right, which is the main thing that makes revisiting the first movie feel so off. Here, she's a nearly helpless, big-haired damsel in distress who has to be rescued. And the fact that she's being targeted solely because she's eventually going to be someone's mom isn't the most empowering storyline for a female science fiction lead. They came to fight for the one woman who could save their future. None of this ruins what is definitely still a great movie, but for a film about the future, it definitely feels dated. The Searchers John Ford's 1956 western The Searchers is one of the most beautiful films ever made and features what is easily the best performance by screen legend John Wayne. Wayne stars as Ethan Edwards, a Civil War veteran who spends years looking for his niece after she's kidnapped by Native Americans, leading him to hate all Comanches. That hate is treated as a flaw in his character, and that's a far more nuanced and progressive perspective than was common in westerns of that era. Unfortunately, that nuance just makes the still-ingrained racism throughout the movie all the more glaring. There's a whole subplot with a Native American woman who believes herself to be married to a white man who has no interest in her, played entirely for laughs. Beyond that, Ethan's blatant racism, particularly when he expresses a willingness to kill his own niece if she's slept with or even been assaulted by a Native American, makes him seem less like a deeply flawed antihero and more like a monster. The Searchers is absolutely worth watching for its cinematography and performances, but there's a lot you'll have to ignore to enjoy it. Holiday Inn Racism has to be pretty egregious to stand out in a movie from 1942, but Holiday Inn manages to pull it off in a single scene. If you've ever seen it, or even just watched the trailer, you already know exactly what we're talking about. The premise of the Bing Crosby Fred Astaire musical revolves around a resort that's only open on holidays, with each holiday having its own song and dance number. It famously gave the world White Christmas, which would go on to become Crosby's signature song and the best-selling single of all time. But not every holiday was so lucky. Abraham Lincoln's birthday is celebrated with a number in which the white performers are dressed as black stereotypes, complete with the exaggerated blackface makeup that was common in racist 19th-century minstrel shows. The entire sequence has been cut from TV airings of the film, but today, most people watch it on DVD or streaming, where it's still there. There's a lot to like in Holiday Inn and a lot of great music and dancing, but this shocking relic that was past its time even in the 40s is enough to ruin the whole thing. Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.